Hello everyone, we are live with Xbox 2 plus 1 episode 15! Dun dun dun, insert sound effects here and all that fanfare stuff. And I am joined this week by Randall419, who can't speak right now because I'm still connecting his audio. <laughs> Rand, can you say something now? Are, you really, are we really going through all these problems still, Jez? <laughs> yes, yes we are. And please, in the chat, can you let me know if the audio levels are balanced between me and Rand? Um, but yes, hi, hi Rand. And... Uh, I just and uh, and you good you good Rand you good. I mean I'm good. I, I like the fact that you're hosting this and it's all you on your problems on your end. Yeah, you know? lots of problems. I'm still trying. I'm still trying to make sure the audio size balance. But uh, Rand, Rand, do you want to introduce our illustrious? I, I wrote I wrote eminent guest eminent. in the description because I thought I thought that was a good good way of putting it. Yes. So this week, uh, we have. Uh, the man who was at one point probably the most hated person in the lives by certain Xbox accounts. Um, oh Nate the Hate is joining us. Welcome, Nate. Thank you for having me. And you are right. I was hated by many Xbox accounts back in January. And it was an interesting time. A lot of a lot of threats were made. A lot of abuse. Some people did come back to apologize. To my surprise, oh, you you, you did actually get some apologies. I was wondering if people would apologize. Yeah, a few people came back. They're like, "Hey, I'm sorry. Like, I still don't believe you, but you know, Microsoft has issues." And other people were like, "Hey, you were right. Congratulations on that." But it was an interesting few weeks in that lead up of Microsoft announcing those multi plat plans and how they're, I guess, intending to approach it, but. Man, I did not realize that little bit of information back in January was going to set the world ablaze and essentially doom the Xbox brand for all of 2024. Yeah, I, I remember when you when you put that out there. I think I DM'd you. I'm like, look what you've done. You've destroyed Xbox. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. I, the funny part is, like, when I put it out there front and center of my thumbnail i had indiana jones mm -hmm. and i had talked about i was like hey i think indiana jones is going to come later this year it's going to be 2024 release and i had some people responding to that saying there's no way indiana jones is happening this year we haven't even seen the game i was like i was hoping people maybe would have clung to that piece of information a little more than the multi-platform part but no everyone clung to the multi-platform yeah and as the, expected and yeah, of course, it was slightly negative news. I say that in air quotes, but then Microsoft did detail it and people, I want to say, became very accepting of the initiative, at least at least partially because the games that have been announced for multiplayer aren't that big of a deal. And some of them are reviewing quite well. Pentiment right now is reviewing exceptionally well on the Switch and hopefully getting the sales that it deserves because let's be honest, nobody played it on the Xbox outside of myself and uh maybe you <laughs> i mean i played it for an hour and deleted it so okay so mostly me <laughs> yeah, mostly you because I, I remember mvg mvg who we, we had on the show um maybe a couple months ago he hated that game if i recall correctly <laughs> yeah he hated it then he went back to it a week or so later he's like okay this game's actually pretty cool but nobody i knew was playing this game and it's a shame. It's really good story, great characters. Hopefully it finds a new audience with it going multi-plat, though just the nature of the game, you really have to question whether or not anyone is even caring about it now. But considering it was only made by, what, about 10 people, I'm sure they made the budget back and made a little extra revenue as well. Yeah. Right now, I believe it's an 86 on Xbox and a 93 on Switch. So... Hey, that's the... First 90 plus Metacritic game from Xbox Game Studios dating back to what a Forza Ori? Horizon game or yeah, oh, that Forza, Forza Horizon 5 was above a 90 in 2021. Yeah, yeah, then we have Ori and Gears of War 3. So it's ranking there's up been, there there's been games the that are close. Psychonauts 2 was close. Uh, yep, Hi Fi Rush, Hi Fi Rush, Hi Fi Rush was well. really close. Halo Infinite. Mm -hmm. I know people have a revisionist history on Halo, but when it launched, it was uh. It was like an eighty-seven, so it was it was it was up there. I think it, um, I think it should be revisited and maybe be rescored, considering the multiplayer now is really fleshed out. A lot more maps, weapons, you know, gameplay types. 
It's a much different game now than it was when it launched. Yeah, but I mean, you only get one chance to uh, to impress people, to make a good first impression, which Halo did, but then they just didn't have any content afterwards for their live service push, and everybody kind of fell yeah. off the game anyways. But, um, you know, for anybody that doesn't know you, I mean, I think people know you because you're a reputable insider, quote unquote, but you also are on the podcast scene. You've been doing a podcast uh, on your YouTube channel, Nate the Hate with MVG, where you, you know, talk about industry topics, um, as well as you and uh, John from Spawnwave started an Xbox podcast, right? Most recently? Yes, it's called Direct Xbox. It's a homage to the original Xbox's prototype or in development name, which was, you know, Direct Xbox. And yeah, we talk about the Xbox on that podcast every two weeks. And right now it's doing well. Talk about just everything that's happening with Microsoft or just the industry, depending on the week, as Xbox has been slow in the last few weeks. Yeah, we have that Xbox podcast as well as my own, as you mentioned, Nate the Hate with MVG, where we talk about the entire industry, Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, anything that's happening there. So yeah, all over the podcast circuit. Yeah. And Jez, you wanted to ask Nate about his name, right? (laughs) Yes. Nate. Um, this is the first time I think we've really crossed paths, although I'm very aware of your work and appreciate it very muchly. One thing I've always been curious about is why are you called Nate the Hate? Why, why, <laughs> why, why the hate, bro? Well, <laughs> mate. When I, I was on the Spawncast, and when we would talk about topics, everyone would get super hyped up over just that stand-in trailer that would show us nothing but CG (laughs) and then end with the logo. And I'd just be the one sitting there saying, I have to see something. I can't be excited about a game that hasn't shown us anything. It'd be like, it'd be as though us being excited for contraband, a trailer that showed us literally nothing. And people would say, Oh, you just hate everything. I said, no, I don't hate anything. I just need substance. I need something to sink my fangs into to say, okay, I can be excited about this project. I need details. So it just naturally became an easy brand, Nate the Hate. So it really just came down to, I don't fall for that false hype cycle. You're not going to trick me with bull shots and such. I need substance. I need, I need something there to get me excited. So I guess you could just say the hate comes from being, you know, rational and logical and reasonable, <laughs> which aren't exactly the most attractive things in the gaming circuit because everyone wants that hype and excitement. I just view things a little differently. I want to hold the co- you know companies accountable if they don't deliver. I just hate those nonsensical trailers of get excited for this new project. You showed us a logo, <laughs> so you're a hater. Give me more, is what, give me more. what what I'm hearing? What I'm hearing right now? So I, I take it you were, you wasn't a fan of the Elder Scrolls Six trailer. <laughs> No, <laughs> need something. Need something uh, more than just a pretty sunset. <laughs> so, so, so you're, I, so you're raining. You're raining on everyone's parade. I get it now. Well, as a, as a yep. Brit, I I've decided that I'm going to call you Nate the Mate. Nate the Mate. That's that's. I think I think that's I think that's more pleasant. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's a, that's an interesting story. But uh, mm. yes, uh, there's been a, quite a lot of quite a lot of news and random stuff bits and pieces here and there i'm just catching up on some of it now because i've been kind of out of it today um but uh, i don't know where where you wanted to start really i suppose well, I, I, rand, rand is, rand's usually better at framing yeah this stuff. I, well i i wanted to start with and we'll get to everything we'll cover like you know the starfield stuff and like xbox's third party push and everything but i i, I did see a article day today. I don't know if you saw it, Nate, but from uh, Gene Park over at the Washington Post about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. They were talking about the game and it sort of implied or directly said that the remake and Rebirth were PlayStation console exclusives. I think in the article he wrote that the whole trilogy was, uh, but then he had to amend it and said, no, it's just the first two um, that were console exclusive. And because there's been a lot of, you know, uh, Xbox fans holding on to dear hope that the games would come to Xbox after a certain amount of time, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think? What is uh? Do you think Xbox fans should still cling on to hope? And maybe think, all right, maybe after the third game comes out in 2028, maybe there's a chance all three will come out? Or is it time for Xbox fans to just give up the ghost and just being like, it's never coming? I think it's going to be the case, as you said, with the former. I think once the trilogy is out on PlayStation, we will see those games coming over to the Xbox. But as you said, we're talking 2028, 2029. So maybe for the current gen, Xbox fans should give up that hope. And ideally, it would be something in that first year for the next generation of systems. But Sony seems to have approached this deal with a very lucrative offer to Square Enix to secure these games as those timed exclusives. They want Final Fantasy VII to be a brand for the PlayStation. And that's largely where people associate Final Fantasy VII anyways, is to the original PlayStation, even though there was a PC version of the game. But I think it's going to be that time type deal where once the trilogy is complete, it will come to Xbox. It's really just a question of when will we see the games and how will they approach that release? Would you do a kind of a trilogy pack where you get all three games or are you going to start it with remake and then a year later do rebirth a year later do the final entry of the trilogy? So really depends how Square Enix wants to approach that. But given that we know Square Enix and Microsoft have somewhat renewed their relationship i do think it's just a matter of time before final fantasy 7 does find its way to the xbox brand of consoles just a question of current gen or is it going to be the next generation of xbox that sees final fantasy 7 remake rebirth and such finally call itself you know find itself there and call it home yeah i've been kind of like holding out hope i i have remake and rebirth on my playstation and I got halfway through remake, but I got addicted to Warzone, so I never went back. So I'm just like, well, if I go back, I'm like, if I have to, I'd have to start the game over, right? Because I don't really remember what happened. But I'm like, ah, if I'm starting this over, I would much rather start it over on my Xbox, right? Get get my achievements, all that sort of stuff. So I've been kind of been like, eh, I'll just wait. You know, maybe it'll happen. We, we Square Enix is talking about doing things differently and all that sort of stuff. But then I saw that article today from. Gene Park and I'm like, hmm, maybe I should just go back and just play remake and then go right to rebirth now. Because if I have to wait all the way to 2028, what's the point? I might as well just play it now. And I could play it again right. in 2028. I just, I don't, I, I guess like from Square Enix perspective, it's like, it's not even just the Xbox. I would imagine it couldn't even come to whatever Nintendo's doing with their successor, right? Which seems right. to be, you'd be missing out on so much. Um, Mm -hmm. like that, I I don't know. I mean, that's the tough thing, especially with these types of deals is that it, is it going to be a case of Sony is viewing Microsoft as a direct competitor, but they're not viewing Nintendo and let's say the switch Two as that direct competitor. So maybe there is a clause in this time of exclusivity that they could potentially bring it to the switch Two before they would bring it to Xbox. Or is there a parody of, you can't bring this anywhere until we as Sony grant you that permission or just have that mutual understanding and respect between the companies of we came to you to make a deal we get the trilogy once the trilogy is out you can bring this to any platform you want because we have seen some of those leaked deals where sony tries to be a little you know tactful in their phrasing to prevent microsoft from getting a game let's say on game pass i think it was resident evil 8 where sony had first right to the game to come to PlayStation Plus before Capcom could even offer it to Microsoft or Game Pass. Mm-hmm. So it really comes down to how this deal was struck. But you have to envision that this trilogy is not going anywhere until you know Sony has it sec- secure for X amount of years, and then it will trickle to these other platforms. And it almost feels as though Sony wants to keep it exclusive for as long as they can to limit the appeal of the release on those other platforms because they want you to buy it here and now they want to make that money and sell hardware so if there's even that idea that it could come to the switch to or the xbox let's just say 18 months 24 months after it launches on the playstation that limits the appeal slightly and sony just wants to secure it as that exclusive probably for the duration of the generation just to dilute the appeal of it going multi-platform 
Yeah, I feel like Final Fantasy 16, though, on the other hand, is probably going to come faster yeah, uh, would, than the other one. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Final Fantasy 16 comes to Xbox, let's say, this time next year. I feel yeah. like that's going to be an exclusive for PlayStation for an extremely short period of time because I love the game. I will play it again when it comes to Xbox. But Final Fantasy 16 was not the cup of tea for the vast majority of Final Fantasy fans due to the way the party interacted. There was really no point of using magics because there was no elemental effects. Yeah, and which was weird. It was weird. And the side quests were... Awful? Yeah, very slow. Primarily it's just like padding. It's like two dev teams made, made the game. It's like the one who's made the main quest and the boss fights and the one who made all the side quests. Yeah, the side quests were, were just so like, hey, go get me a wrench. Okay. And it's the table next to the character. Like, you couldn't do this yourself. Yeah. I really can't wait for Jez to play 16. The highs are so I mean, high. It's just the low. Re- like, dude, the, the, the Titan boss fight. Oh, oh Lord. Titan. What is it like? Titan, Bahamut. They, they're some of the greatest boss battles in gaming history. Are they actually? Are they, I, I, want, I haven't looked into Final Fantasy 16 much because I don't want spoilers and stuff. But, like, are they actually boss battles or are they just interactive cutscenes? Because honestly, the, bo- the boss <sighs> battles in Final Fantasy VII Remake that had these sort of like seamless transitions from combat into cutscene, they weren't really like what it's- I would consider a boss battle. They were just more like interactive set pieces where you almost couldn't die. You know? Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not it's like, like an that. Elden Ring. Not it's, like an Elden more, Ring or a Monster Hunter or something, it's, where it's actually dynamic. It's more, it's more style over substance. Yeah, like you could fail, but you really have to go out of your way to fail. Yeah, that's, in that's what I'm some of these about, boss yeah. sequences, but they're just so epic and wow that you're not even going to care. But it also kind of works to the narrative of the game, where your character is consistently building to be a badass, where you shouldn't be stoppable. Right, you should be destroying what you're fighting. So I don't know if that was maybe intentional in terms yeah. of game design of you are this badass, so you're going to beat the hell out of all these people with ease, or if it was just a case where they tried to make the game so casual appealing that they essentially stripped it of difficulty. Yeah, I mean, it's I'm not, not sure. it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. Like I play like a bunch of games where stuff like that happens, you know, and I, I like I I think of like. Um, did you guys ever you guys played Metal Gear Rising, right? Revengeance. Yeah. That kind yes. that kind Love of that did game. similar with some of its boss battles where I think like they'd have these phases which probably were quite failable, especially on harder difficulties, but then they would seamlessly transition into ridiculous, spectacular, sort of scripted moments in mid mid fight and stuff like that. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that Final Fantasy 16 does it, but um I'm def I'm definitely going to be playing it. I am this sort of Final Fantasy 16 is really annoying for me because I am I am a huge Xbox guy primarily. I think I play like I, I'm 70% Xbox at the moment and about 30% PC. Well, maybe like 25% PC and then 5% cloud, <laughs> which I suppose is still Xbox at the end of the day. Um, but like I'm also a huge Final Fantasy guy. Like there's there's not really anything else on PlayStation I'm that interested in playing except for Final Fantasy. And it's kind of like, do I want this huge plastic monolith just for Final Fantasy? Kind of not really, especially when I know they're all going to come to PC anyway, eventually. So Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of like, yeah, but it's still, it's still painful watching Square Enix, like do everything they can to not be on Xbox, you know? Um, and I suppose it's it's part of you know the ongoing thing with Microsoft, where a lot of these big name franchises, Microsoft really has to fight for them. They really had to fight for Persona, and they really had to fight for. And Yakuza you know what's and... funny? Is you say that Persona Three, yes, was in the was in the show today. Oh, um, three. They was announced, they, yeah, Persona Three Reloaded was in the show. Yes, and they announced uh, the expansion pass with. Oh, right. uh, with a DLC like story expansion at the end of the year, that's free to Xbox Game Pass Ultimate members, Jez. 
Oh wow, that's really like unique. I don't know. I know. I I know, Nate. You didn't. You said you didn't get the chance to watch it yet. But um, did you see that news about the no, story deals? Yeah, it was like Wave One comes in March, and I think it's just kind of like music, like extra music, and then Wave Two comes in July, and it's like I think costumes or something, and then Wave Three in the fall is like. It's like some girl, like episode, it's called like episode Agni or something. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's free to Game Pass Ultimate members. Have they done that before? Helldivers, or not Helldivers. Um, <laughs> Hive Busters. <laughs> Helldivers. Hive, Hive Busters. Hive okay. Busters was free if you had Game Pass Ultimate, yeah. Intriguing. Well, they haven't done it very much then, but I they guess. They haven't done that a lot, and here they are with that. And you, you you mentioned Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy fourteen was also in the partner showcase today. And what about it? Um, they gave the full release date. Up, uh, it's like March fourteenth. Uh, and they also mentioned in the thing uh, that it has uh, Game Pass perks to like skip levels. I believe. I'm sure the chat Holy would know crap. because B B B S B S I G or uh, B S I G G says ep- it's episode Algus. It's the answer DLC. Now I've never played Persona, so I have no idea what that is. Uh, it's I think the DLC Nate, from PS3 it. Reload. So this is, but um, yeah, that that's definitely interesting. And and the one thing I, I often talk to Microsoft contacts about is like, why aren't you guys doing more stuff with perks, man? Because like one one thing that I really like about Amazon Prime is that every couple of weeks I get an email from Amazon Prime saying, uh. uh Go to Twitch to get your free Hearthstone packs or your free mounts for World of Warcraft or free this and free that for all Microsoft games. <laughs> that Microsoft games now, and I know that I know these are con- these are like long term contracts, but I kind of feel like why can't why can't I get Candy Crush money with Xbox Game Pass? Why can't I get uh, Hearthstone packs with Xbox Game Pass perks and and all this other kind of stuff. And so it's kind of cool to hear that like Final Fantasy XIV is getting some kind of perks with Xbox Game Pass. They need to do more of that kind of stuff, especially if they're going like abroad to other consoles. Like maybe like give give like uh, if someone's playing Grounded on um, or Sea of Thieves on PlayStation, you know maybe exclusive like give it, the perks could give people some people a reason to subscribe to Xbox Game Pass without even owning an Xbox. I mean one thing that always cracks me up is how much Sea of Thieves skins are worth on eBay. Have you seen this, Ryan? Mm. Have you seen like cuz so, some of the at some events they've given away Sea of Thieves skins. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. at, at E3 and at Gamescom and also like with certain controllers and certain accessories and stuff like that. There's like exclusive skins and people sell the codes on eBay for hundreds of pounds. Hundreds of pounds. And it's kind of like, if skins are worth that much to some people, they could be in Game Pass, man. But I suppose maybe the ex- it's the exclusivity that makes them worth that much. And I suppose if they're easy to get, they wouldn't be worth that much. I don't know. Yeah. I don't well, know, the final, man. So the Final Fantasy XIV thing is uh, it's a starter edition that will be available through Xbox Game Pass Ultimate Perks for a limited time from March 21st to April 19th. So whatever the starter pack is. And uh, Donna Takut says in chat that Persona 3 Reloaded only included the base uh, P3 game and didn't include the add-on for P3 FES, the answer. Now they're selling that cut content as an expansion six months later. So, yeah. Mm. Anyways, I, it's just funny when you mentioned like these franchises they tried hard to get, and they're, you know, they're really going hard on Atlas content. Uh, it seems Which is Sega right, content, really. Sega content, and you know the Final Fantasy stuff, but. Uh, jo- Joaquin um, Brancher said the skeleton skin for Sea of Thieves is $280 on eBay right now. Crazy. That's hilarious. Um, but there's also like one thing that does annoy me, right, about the fi- the Final Fantasy stuff uh, at the event, you know, and I haven't watched the event yet. I need to go and watch it. But it's it's also like, man, these are these are like we're getting crumbs, man. We get mm. we're getting crumbs. Your Final Fantasy 14's not a new game, you know, and and while it's cool to see Final Fantasy finally be associated with Xbox, even if it's in some small way, 
There's still no Pixel remasters, still no Final Fantasy VII remakes, no sign of Final Fantasy sixteen, you know, all this other kind of stuff and no foam stars, right? Yeah. No foam star <laughs> <laughs> It's foam stars a thing. Like, do we know no, if it's, it's actually not. done done any has it done well at all? Do we know? I this? don't think so. Let the foam <laughs> stars I almost stats. I almost for, I almost sort of think that like Square Enix was like all right, PlayStation, you can have Final Fantasy, but you're also buying foam stars from us. <laughs> <laughs> so, know, like... I, there's no, um, there's, there doesn't seem to be any Steam. Okay, so. It's not on PC. Uh, oh, it's not on foam, PC. Foam stars is a PS5 and PS4 exclusive. All right, let's, uh, well, the only metric we can really look at then is Twitch viewership, I guess. So let's have a. Let's have a quick look at Twitch for your shit for funsies. Dude, my buddies, <laughs> the, my, my three buddies who always play multiplayer, they um, they they all got PlayStation Plus for the month so they can download it, right? Because it was on there. Because they because everybody knew nope, nobody was gonna buy Foam Stars. They played five matches and deleted the game and canceled their PlayStation Plus subscriptions. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it free or do you have to pay for it? They added it to PlayStation Plus for the month, so you needed to be oh, a PlayStation Plus shit. um subscriber. Uh but it's gone I think it's I think it left now cuz it's only available for a month. Okay, well, let's play a little game. Nate Rand, let's play a little game. Okay. Guess how many viewers Foam Stars has on Twitch right now and the person who guesses the closest wins. Okay. You win nothing, I'll but let you win. Hmm. I will go with 57 57 okay that's <laughs> the games i think the game's been out almost for a month right like hell divers came out two days after foam stars or maybe it was vice versa and hell divers maxes out at four hundred and forty thousand something on steam every night uh that's just on steam who knows what it's doing on twitch i'm gonna say i'll go a little bit higher than nate i'll say i'll, I'll say 110 it has 13 viewers on Twitch. No way! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, like, even though, like, I feel like you were both lowballing a bit, it was, yeah, I, I would think it's safe to say that game's not going to last the year. It's going to be an, a Crash Bash situation, I think, or whatever that game was called. Crash Rumble. I can't remember yeah, what it's called. I'm... Crash something? Yeah, I forget what it was called. Uh, Crash and burn. Crash and burn. <laughs> Crash and burn. Yeah. You know, speaking of that, I wanted to ask Nate. Um, so one of the one of the rumors that you put out yeah, recently that uh, you're well known for is about the bird and the bear. Banjo. Banjo. Uh, we have a lot of oh, we have a lot of banjo bros in the chat <laughs> um, that are constantly talking about that game. So a, a lot of people thought that with the news of Toys for Bob going independent, mm -hmm. that they were the ones working on Banjo, and now they're no longer because they're independent. Um, it, do you, as far as you know, do you know that Banjo's still being worked on, at least according to what you've heard recently? Yeah, as far as I know, the game is still being worked on. It's still very early, still you know prototyping those ideas and such. The issue I've always had is I was never told the developer on the project. So a lot of people naturally just made that assumption like, oh, Toys for Bob would be a perfect fit. And now with the news of them going independent, it's definitely shaken that up a bit. I wish I knew who was working on this game. That's the one detail I cannot get clarity on. I've heard a few names tossed around that I've never been able to confirm. But as far as I know, yeah, the project is still in development, still being workshopped. The ideas are still being explored. The scope is still being figured out. So it's, it's a case of probably spoke of the game too soon. Mm. And as most Xbox games. <laughs> yeah, it's really a case now of hopefully the game does eventually release and doesn't get canceled in the shadows and never happens because you know how the reception would be to if that type of thing happens. But as far as I know, still being worked on, and hopefully it does see the light of day eventually. Mm. What was I've, your um, overall... Oh, sorry. go ahead, Jess, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I've, I've definitely been guilty of, you know, talking about game projects way too early. 
So, yes, you have. And so, so and sometimes it's like it's difficult. It's like how do you how do you gauge? Because sometimes you just don't know, and you know, and it's one reason why like, I I don't really talk about. I'm a lot more careful than I used to be about this kind of thing. Um, partially, you know, with the with the advice of Rand. <laughs> I got a Rand saying, oh, I'm going to delete this. And Rand's like, are you sure you want to do that, Jed? Um, <laughs> I literally had someone message me this evening about a new Dead Rising because I'd, I'd said on Twitter that I'd heard that Capcom was exploring rebooting or doing a sequel or something with Dead Rising. Um and like, and then I put that out there, and then one of my sources who who told me about this, they were like, "You put that out way too early, man." <laughs> so like, maybe it's just not going to happen now. And everyone, and like the Dead Rising community is just going to be like angry at me forever. But it's it's tough sometimes with that kind of thing. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, about Toys for Bob, Nate. Were you shocked to see them go through the layoffs? And then to essentially then being like, oh, we're independent now, but yes. we might be still working with Microsoft. Like, yeah. How, how'd you feel about that? It was definitely surprising. And I'd love, I would love to have been a fly on the wall to hear how that negotiation went of how they were able to get their independence because you had Phil Spencer express the importance that Toys for Bob would have mm-hmm. and how they were something that they were looking forward to. And as I believe it's been Jez and some other individuals in the Xbox community have put out there, they were that perfect company to bring in the youth market to the Xbox because you have the 3D mascot characters for platformers that they could develop, and that would be that youthful market. And now to allow them to go independent, I wonder if maybe that meeting was a case of we could lay you off and you're just going to create your own company with all the same employees anyways, or we will keep you through this round. We will allow you to have your independence and we can work together on the future by contracting you to do some projects with us. That way there's no you know, bad blood between us. But it was definitely a surprise because mm-hmm. I thought that would have been a company that Microsoft would have wanted to hold on to because you now have Crash, you have Spyro, you have a talented developer who can take on something like, let's just say, Tim Schafer didn't want to do a Psychonauts and Toys for Bob could pitch a Psychonauts vision of their own that you could allow them to work with that. Or if they came in and say, Hey, we have an ambitious idea for a new banjo project or blinks or sneakers, any type of project you have this company. Now, I guess you technically still have them in the sense of you can contract them to work on some of these IPs and allow them to be very creative, have that independence and freedom to do what they want. But I would love to know how that deal just came about and why Microsoft approved them to go independent unless their intention was to eventually lay off and disband that company in, let's say, the next six to 12 months anyways. And this was just a more appealing, attractive way of letting them go without letting them go. I've sort of... I've heard some things tentatively about Toys for Bob. I don't know if I've I don't know if I've mentioned this too or not around. But um You did talk a little bit about it on the podcast on Friday, what you had heard. Okay. Well, I heard that I heard that Toys for Bob were in the driver's seat with regards to some of this stuff. Like, first of all, there was the whole thing about them going remote and closing the studio down, uh, or closing up the rent or whatever. I heard Toys for Bob spearheaded that initiative, right? For starters. And then and then they were just kind of like discussing with themselves as a team about going independent. And I was told that Toys for Bob never there was a lot of bad blood between Toys for Bob and Activision Corporate. And like you have to remember Toys for Bob was um uh you know they're they're an old studio they're 35 years old you know i didn't know exactly how old they were i just looked it up on wikipedia they were founded in 1989 and they're a subsidiary of crystal dynamics um from 1993 to, to the year 2000 and then they were acquired by activision in 2005 and um so there's there's they're a studio with a very storied history and and um you know and a lot of these games are um I haven't 
really experienced myself um but they do have like a really long storied history and obviously like i think a lot of what they're really known for and what really blew them up was skylanders they did like a ton of skylanders games and at the time skylanders was like this huge big project and and um i think i put it out there i think i put it out there that microsoft wants to wanted to revive skylanders and i was kind of like well you know that that also that kind of feeds into what you were saying that about the youth market because skylanders was this huge thing and there's like there's like a huge bunch of maybe kids of a certain age or well i suppose gen z like in their early 20s now who grew up playing skylanders and you know microsoft had an opportunity to associate that with xbox potentially but it seems like with this move they've kind of relinquished that you know but they have retained all of the ip they own crash they own spyro and i I definitely feel like they were teasing spyro in that message because they were like they um in that uh in that message where they posted on their website they were like keep your horns on which was definitely it was definitely a call out to um to uh you know the spyro fans out there who were hoping to to get a new spyro game but i think like yeah, it, it does feel like Toys for Bob was the architects of their de- their own destiny here, and hopefully it's just for the best, you know. And I just hope that yeah. it, it it we do still get content from these teams and these studios, and that Microsoft still carries on supporting them and stuff like that. But I yeah, that I, I think that's the key hope here is that if Microsoft can continue to contract them and keep a working relationship open with them. They really don't lose anything here because Microsoft still has that ownership of those IPs, Spyro, Crash, and such. And if you find a valuable partner here that you know you can work with moving into the future and you allow them to have that creative freedom that they really do excel at, there's nothing lost here except you just don't have ownership of that company anymore. Which, who's to say if in five years or so, Toys for Bob won't be looking for you know, a parent owner and comes to Microsoft saying, hey, we've worked well. We like working with you. You've been very supportive of us. We wouldn't mind coming into the fold with you now that we're ready to have an owner. Just don't put us on Call of Duty, please. Right, <laughs> yep. That has to be in, that's to be a stipulation in the contract. We cannot be assigned to Call of Duty. That was, uh, that was a huge studios. that was a huge point of contention for Toys for Bob. They hated working on they, well, they, they they just didn't want to be working on Call of Duty. And I think, like, Call of Duty had become part of their cash flow model. And, yeah, I think it just became problematic for Microsoft and everyone involved about how are we going to cash flow the studio to get them to where they want to be, and it's going to take more investment at a time when we potentially don't have money to invest in the near term. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just... it's. Yeah. There was always going to be this huge cascade of disruption, um, I think, with some of this stuff. And uh, there's probably going to be more disruption. And I um, I speculated, speculated, I really want to, really want to repeat this, I speculated, 100% speculation, that maybe other Microsoft Studios might w- see what's happened to Toys for Bob and wonder if they can't do the same thing. And if Microsoft's looking to, you know, to reduce costs... There are studios within Microsoft that just don't have that kind of cash flow right now. You got like studios like, you know, Bethesda, who sell a lot of legacy games. They've got service games and mobile games that bring in money. So like, I can't see Microsoft divesting Bethesda, for example. But some of the smaller studios, which don't have any games that are selling uh, or have a huge amount of cash flow, you know, like um, Double Fine, for example. Um, and you know, and the double fine has an auteur culture as well. And they've also got like, uh, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of history and a lot of culture. I do wonder, mm-hmm. like, could they be a studio that looks, seeks to do something like this? Do you think you, do you think personally we could see all well, the studios like Toys for Bob move on? Have you heard any rumblings to that effect? Like, I haven't heard any rumblings to that effect, but on, uh, the direct Xbox podcast last week, a user did ask, like, if we had to speculate or give an opinion, do we think a company could do similar as Toys for Bob? Mm-hmm. And one of the companies I had mentioned was, I wouldn't be too surprised if we saw Tango ah, right, go yeah. independent again, just because it's a Japanese company. 
there's you know the potential of culture clash and when you look at the games that they put out they're not exactly you know hardware movers they're not going to be huge sellers so i wouldn't be surprised if you saw a company like tango potentially ask for independence again and you know microsoft would have to weigh their that pro and con are they valuable enough to keep within that umbrella of xbox game studios or would you grant them independence like i'm not saying this would happen but that's one of the companies i th- wouldn't be surprised if it happened it wouldn't take me by you know shock yeah interesting i think um i think that is an interesting point because um shinji mikami ever ever present with his sort of vagueness <laughs> sometimes when he comments i think i think he posted on facebook or twitter or somewhere like that he posted something like maybe we will see the evil within again but like he also like left microsoft and capcom as well because not wanting to live in that corporate life you know so maybe it's kind right. of like maybe they're in talks to spin off again shinji comes back to run tango they license the evil within three and work on it as an independent entity and maybe they get more creative freedom and they don't have to work within the microsoft corporate structure i do wonder if microsoft's not just thinking like maybe it's better for us to have the ip and treat some of these studios as external partners because they don't work well within our system you know because one thing that often comes up with Microsoft is the corporate culture is can be stifling. And I think this was this was like again, this is all speculation, but like informed speculation, I guess. Um Halo Infinite is often cited as an example of Microsoft's corporate culture negatively impacting game development. I don't know if you've heard anything to that effect. Well, that's because they were using all the contractors, right? I mean that's that's one of the discussion yeah i mean they used a lot of contractors they were also bringing in other first party studios to aid and assist the development i mean halo infinite's development one day is going to have a very long retrospect of what went right and a very long sequence of what went wrong luckily you know the games made a nice recovery but someone needs to tell the full tale of exactly what happened there because there's been a lot of you know speculation of they would go in for checks 343 would lie about the state of the game to microsoft managers and stuff that's what i heard yeah it's a question of like how much of the truth is that how much is you know emotional testimony by a angry employee we need a tell-all documentary of what exactly happened with the schreier book yeah (laughs) jason schreier expose on this stuff i heard he was working on one actually I mean, it would. Source source told me they'd spoken to Jason about it as well. I Um, mean, I'd I'd want to know, right? Because I mean, there's rumors that that Halo was what five hundred million dollar project, right? And it was supposed to launch with the console, and then got delayed a year, and then they still really weren't ready with like live service stuff, and then you got to basically fire every high profile senior person at the studio replace everybody bonnie ross like and yeah there is a story there's a story there to be told for sure you know um i'm like the only reason like i sort of feel like uh, the uh conversation around hey could another studio go independent because it sort of feels like that what microsoft does rather than shutting studios down right it's like in their history like they let Toys for Bob go, right? They they uh, let uh, Press Play go. They let um, Twisted no, Pixel they go. Actually, they actually shut Press Play down. Oh, they shut Press Play down. So they, they let Twisted Pixel go, right? Yeah, they let Twisted Pixel go independent. But they did they did shut they did shut Press Press Play down. But Press Play spun off into three separate studios, and one of which made Deep Rock Galactic. So. And also, Deep Rock Galactic was pitched to Microsoft as a as a yeah. pro, as a project, and Microsoft. But it's like maybe the biggest the biggest example of this is Bungie bought their independence back from Microsoft. Oh yeah, that's true. And I mean, you know, and, yeah, and Mi- it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? I think I think 
and I don't know, Nate, if you would agree with this. I think the Microsoft of, or the Xbox of 2018, 2019, and 2020, and what their visions are and plans are, are different than the Xbox that acquired ABK. Yeah, it's a very different company today. I think I think so. It's like I, Jazz had put this out there, but like you know, if Xbox had acquired ABK, would they would they still have wanted Double Fine? And it's sort of like you could see, well, maybe maybe not, right? And I know there's people in the chat saying you can't really keep on getting rid of studios, or you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I agree with that, but also I think Microsoft's plans post ABK have changed significantly from what they were. Uh, when they were acquiring these studios and acquiring Bethesda, I think it's like shifted a lot of their stuff. So, yeah, I mean, right now I feel like one of Microsoft's core goals is they they want to be one of the premier publishers in the gaming industry, which they can now be with Bethesda and ABK under their label. They've immediately propelled themselves to one of the more dominant gaming publishers. Now, with that, it's going to come multi-platform games, naturally. And the Microsoft vision of 2024 is not the Microsoft vision of 2020 or even 2018, as you mentioned. Their focus has evolved. It's different. They seem to be looking further down the road than what they had been doing. And with that comes a lot of risk. It's going to be a lot of gambles. And it's going to be a question of, is it going to pan out for Microsoft, not just as a company, but also as fans, as consumers want them to be? Because it's kind of an interesting time if you're an Xbox fan, because there's so much uncertainty of what the future holds for this brand. The multi-plat initiative is just kind of one step in that unknown. Is Microsoft going to just be that powerhouse of a publisher that retains exclusives of premier franchises while also selling hardware and really being the Microsoft that we see in the PC market where you have Word and Excel on Mac and other operating systems where the brand isn't restricted to just the box. It's going to be on an array of devices where everywhere houses Xbox to some extent. And if that's the case, they can make a lot more money, they can invest in a lot more projects and initiatives, and they can take risks again. Because when Microsoft and Xbox were at their best, they were taking risk. The original Xbox was a risk. The Xbox 360 was looking to innovate and be creative, take risks with Xbox Live achievements. They were the trendsetters of so much of what the industry is today. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the Xbox One, the only risk they took was the Connect, which was a terrible hmm. initiative led by Don Matrick. And the DRM. And DRM, yeah. And when you look at the Xbox series, there's really no risk or creativity happening in this generation yet. I want Microsoft to go back to their roots, go back to the original Xbox and the Xbox 360. That's what made the Xbox such an appealing, exciting brand. The only risk they've really taken, I guess you could make the argument is, Day one PC releases. And Would you consider Game Pass uh, yes. a risk? As a service, that was a huge risk. And I remember talking about it when they first you know, announced it. At, what was that, about 2018? That was uh, 2017 when they when they announced it. And then 2018 was then, it, when, then they announced in 2018 that their games would go on their uh, day one. Yeah. Okay. So like that was a risk because you were viewing it as a consumer of... I have to invest X amount of dollars and I would get all of your first party games day one. And as a business, that's a huge risk because you're essentially gambling that people will subscribe to a service and then forget to cancel it. Now, it hasn't translated well to this current generation because Microsoft hasn't really released all that many games in a single calendar year to this point. 2024 will buck the trend where we will finally see more than two or three games come out. But it was a risk. And so far, I mean, depending on who you ask, some will say it's been very successful for them. Some will say it hasn't been that big of a success because it flatlined fairly quick. But that comes back to the point of you haven't made software. You can't sell a software-based service without having games to sell the service for. 
And maybe they thought Starfield was going to be a big mover of Game Pass subscriptions, and it clearly wasn't based on the figures that we have now. But now that you have Hellblade 2, Avowed, Indiana Jones, you have a steady flow of games. It's going to make Game Pass more appealing, but I still think there's work to be done with Game Pass where you can make it more appealing, be it as Jez was mentioning earlier, add additional perks, make Game Pass Ultimate, one of the perks be early access. And I know they make a lot of money with those early access deals with games like Forza Horizon where, and even Starfield where people were paying that $30 to play the game a week early. But if you give that by default to Ultimate members, you'll have more Ultimate subscribers. So I think they have to incentivize that higher tier more than they're doing right now. And maybe you'll create a little more urgency in subscribing to Game Pass. Because right now, if you don't have the games, it's a hard sell to get people to invest $180 a year if you're only releasing $120 worth of games. Because the third-party stuff, while some of it is attractive, MLB The Show Day 1, fantastic release, but lately, we're not getting any huge day one third-party games. It almost feels as though maybe Microsoft is even kind of downscaling their investment in certain day one releases. Like, yes, you have Persona, you have some of the Like a Dragon, Yakuza games, but those games alone aren't reason enough to be a subscriber to Game Pass. You need more incentive to do it. So hopefully they're able to find that footing again, because when it launched, Huge Gamble seemed as though it was paying off, but they also had games at that point. Yeah, 2022 sort of killed them on that because it was like, we got Game Pass, but then again, we got no games to to tag along with it. And we don't know. I mean, maybe they lost a whole bunch of subs in 2022 and then gained a lot of them back in 2023 with like Starfield and like Mm -hmm. Liza P and stuff. But yeah, I mean, they say they got 10 games releasing this year, so uh, that's quite a lot. And then they probably have a whole bunch of next year. Although it's just a little disappointing that... You know, Hellblade 2 is the first game you're releasing in, in the first half of the year, and that's still in May. But then I guess you could say yeah, Microsoft had the biggest exclusive of the whole year so far in Pal World uh, on Game Pass, <laughs> and who knows what, what that did, right? Because I got like 10 million players playing that in the first month. I feel like people... Uh, out of nowhere. People, I kind of feel like people would be like, oh, that doesn't count, that doesn't count. But it's like, why but, doesn't I mean, it count? We're, we're, when we're talking yeah. about Game Pass, it absolutely does, right? Yeah, of course it does. Because that's um, what it was. Of course. But, like, people don't get... People people forget instantly, you know. And pe- everyone's talking about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth right now and stuff like that. Although PlayStation's got another banger. It's like, bro, Xbox just had the biggest exclusive of console exclusive probably of the whole year. Probably. I mean, do, do we foresee any game blowing up as hard as Power World? You know, I, I'm I'm not sure that we will this year. This year, I mean, I mean, Elden I don't think Ring, Sony's maybe? got. I don't think Sony's got any. Well, no, you said exclusive though, right? I don't think Sony has anything on the level. Uh, Nintendo. I can't imagine Princess Peach doing ten million. <laughs> uh, Princess Peach. <laughs> and and there's surprise. no Pokemon game this year, I believe. So, oh, yeah. Pokemon and. With Nintendo, yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't even think Nintendo has a game that would reach that many. But then yeah. again, I don't really know Nintendo's lineup. But well, maybe Nintendo is just going to sue Power World, man. Like, like they did to Yuzu, rip mm. in peace. There was that whole drama this week as well. Now, oh. I got to ask Nate this because he's also known as you know a Nintendo insider, and we don't really talk about Nintendo very much on the show because I'm I'm the resident Nintendo hater. Right. Yeah. Right. Like if if you got <laughs> Nate the hate, and then we got Rand the hate. Whenever we talk about yeah. we talk about Nintendo, but um, I gotta bring it up. Like, so how surprised were you to see Nintendo basically delay internally the Switch successor to the earliest March of next year? Did that really shock you? It was surprising because. I had done a Nintendo predictions episode the first week of February, and that took about two or three weeks to put together to schedule it and such. So I had done a round of checks in the middle of January about the timing of the Switch 2's release and such. And the contacts I was talking they I was talking to, they were all still in agreement. They're like, yeah, it's coming out late 2024. And they were all anticipating a reveal or an announcement 
in the month of March. So we record the predictions episode. I put that information in there as predictions. You know, I'm still anticipating a late 2024 release, an announcement in March. And then about a few days after I put the episode out, probably about five days, I had got a DM from a contact saying, this got delayed till 2025. And I was like, okay, like I need to look into this more. Reached out to some additional contacts and some hadn't heard about it yet, but they were like, well, let me check on things. Within about three days of the initial tip, I had around a dozen contacts coming to me saying, yeah, it's been delayed to 2025. So I was like, Mm. damn. A few days later, all the reports started hitting at the end of that week where Bloomberg and VGC and so forth all reporting it. And I was like, this is, this is really happening. They're going to push it. Then I believe Bloomberg either, they had further elaborated that, or it was Nikkei saying March of 2025 at the earliest. Earliest. So it could be later. And at that point, I had gone back to some contacts like, what is happening here? And one of my contacts say, if it's not out by March, they're like, then something is really going wrong. They're like, because it's definitely not on the hardware front. NVIDIA, the SOC, that is pretty much ready to go. Nintendo just has to sign off at it at this point. So if it's software related, as the reports have been indicating, I guess that falls on Nintendo of your games aren't ready and you're holding back the launch of this hardware, which... People may be very understanding of considering what happened to the Xbox back in 2020, you know, and the whole Halo situation, but it just turns into a case of this is hard for partners. If you're relaying to partners, you know, last summer that you are intending on releasing hardware in the latter half of 2024, and now you're pushing it back six months, it on paper isn't that big of a deal because let's say you get it out in March. It's still the same fiscal year for Nintendo. But as a partner, you are developing games with an intended release at a certain point because that's what you are basing your fiscal year on or even a quarter within your fiscal year. We are intending to get revenue and such. And now that's been changed. You've also allocated resources and everything to port games over or to do native versions of games. And now you're not getting paid on this project for six additional months. It's a long time. It's just... I just really wonder what Nintendo is is doing here because why the switch is aging. Everyone Mm -hmm. will agree on that. Yes. It has a large backlog of games. It still has games coming out this year, but it almost feels as though Nintendo is terrified of moving on from the switch where they don't want to make a mistake and potentially not have a huge success. Like the Wii to the Wii U. Maybe not to that level of you know, cataclysmic disaster. (laughs) But it does feel as though they just want to continue to milk the Switch as long as they can because it's still selling software, still selling well on it. But eventually you do have to move on and it just feels that they're afraid to do it. And I just wonder if, I don't think by waiting it's going to hurt them too much. But at some point you're now launching your successor to the Switch after PlayStation is going to introduce a PlayStation 5 Pro. It's like, you have to get ahead. You have to be active as a console manufacturer. So the the delay to 2025 was definitely a surprise, only because it happened very quick. Mm -hmm. When those reports hit, that information had only been relayed to partners within about a 10-day period prior. This wasn't something that they had known about back in late 2023 or even early January, this was something only a couple of weeks of knowledge that it was going to be pushed into 2025. So it was kind of a case of, even though I was hearing similar from contacts, I was hoping the information was wrong, that that could not happen. And to see so many outlets report it that Friday to end the week, it was taken aback just because it sounds like that nightmare doomsday scenario of you're delaying hardware again. And this kind of goes back to the original Switch where they had that, um, what was like the Giga leak, where they had some of the scheduling that showed they originally had intentions of having the Switch launch in the holiday of 2016 
and had to delay it due to software until early 2017. And depending on what the launch game would be from Nintendo that's you know potentially causing these issues, we haven't had a 3D Mario since Odyssey of October 2017. We haven't had a new Mario Kart since Mario Kart 8. What is causing these delays, Nintendo? And I hope it's not due to them going to now more modern architecture and becoming familiar with engines like, let's say, Unreal Engine 5 or such. Because I don't want a generation from Nintendo of one release where we're waiting six years for a sequel or that they just can't turn out quality products similar to what we saw at the Wii U where they had a very tough time adjusting to HD development. Ideally, that's not the case here because most middleware and such, they should have some form of familiarity with. But it was definitely a surprising delay. And ideally, the ramifications are held to minimum. But we'll find out. That's yeah, interesting. I, was, I, was, I never really thought about a lot of that stuff. It's, like, it's, it's interesting. Like I, I love doing these XB, XB2 plus one shows because... You know, you get a different perspective. Like, like I would never have thought about a lot of that stuff with regards to Nintendo because I, I don't. Really, it's, it's not really my beat, right? But it does have a lot of the Nintendo Switch Two does have a lot of implications potentially for Xbox because it will be at least on paper a more competitive system in terms of spec. You know, mm-hmm. um, they won't right. they won't be they won't be de facto excluded from games like Call of Duty. Or well, I mean, this doesn't really affect Microsoft there because they'll make money from it. But they won't be de facto excluded from games like FIFA or you know some of those other sort of tentpole kind of service games which do require a more powerful system. And that could be you know really disruptive to PlayStation and Xbox because I think right now a lot of re- a lot of reasons why people buy PlayStation and Xbox are, be- are not are not necessarily for games like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth or your God of War. It's for those kind of annualized, habitual games which casual people tend to tend to gun for. You know, your sports games, your NBA, and and all that kind of stuff. And then like even stuff like Mortal Kombat One, which is notor- notoriously completely broken on the Switch, and, and 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 the games that do come are often like shoehorned into the system. But Switch Two shouldn't potentially have as many of those kinds of issues. So um it's definitely it's definitely a wild card to be to consider i suppose yeah i don't know you know we'll see about nintendo right like ron's favorite I, yeah my favorite i mean hey i i do I, i'm i'm still like i still want to play metroid dread and even metroid prime 4 so maybe i'll get a switch bro. to i know but you know i'll get to it there's plenty of time right like i'm just <laughs> saying maybe maybe i maybe i wait for the switch too and Maybe Metroid Dreads even runs better or something. I'll be like, all right, let me let me play this stuff. Maybe maybe I get FOMO, but um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it'll be interesting to see when it launches. I'm the thing I'm super interested in, Nate, it, with the Switch Two is like with the Switch One, AAA games just didn't even bother showing up because it was underpowered, right? And a lot of people bought the Switch as a companion console. Like, they bought it because they wanted to play the Nintendo games, like your Zeldas, your Marios, your Animal Crossings. But then they had to get a PlayStation or an Xbox to play, you know, Alan Wake, Resident Evil, Elden Ring, right? Like, all those sort of games never came to the Switch. I'm sort of wondering what happens in a scenario where the Switch 2 is can do more, right? I think the rumors have it as like an Xbox One PS4 level power-wise maybe, right? Mm-hmm. Some, some along those lines. But what happens if suddenly the AAA games don't skip the Switch? And now people don't... They, they don't need the Switch as a companion console. It can just be their one console, right? Where you, you don't right. need to... So how does that affect the industry where it's like, you know what? I'm inst- I'm used to buying these games over here on PlayStation or Xbox, and I use the Switch to get my Nintendo games or my indie games because I like the portability. But now those consumers are going to be faced with the choice of like, well, I can get the AAA games now on my Switch, and it has the portability factor. 
And maybe that's one of the reasons why, you know, Jez is pretty convinced Microsoft and Xbox is going to be doing a handheld next gen. And there's rumors that even Sony might. Do you think that's going to be the, am I reading too much into this about like people maybe being like, I only need to switch and I don't need a companion console or will games, triple A games still miss because it's still going to be underpowered in comparison to what the series X and the PS five and the eventually next gen systems can do. I mean, it's really hard to say, but I mean, at this point, mobile technology has advanced so far, especially with technologies like DLSS, where NVIDIA technology would allow Nintendo to do a lot more on limited hardware than, you know, what paper would otherwise imply. So when the Switch 2 comes out, it's going to be a very capable, portable machine. But we've also seen other very capable portable machines like the Steam Deck. Now, the Steam Deck doesn't have NVIDIA technology, so it doesn't have things like DLSS to enhance that experience. And it's really going to come down to, I guess, the consumer and depending on your age bracket. As I get older, I would definitely prefer the idea of having a very capable hybrid type of system so I can play the games in my you know, leisure, be it commuting, at work, or just being able to turn on a football, baseball, basketball game on the TV or a movie and still be able to play a game in that portable setting. So I think for a company, be it Microsoft or Sony, having a handheld companion piece of hardware is absolutely the direction they have to take. I think it would be a fool's errand not to have a handheld skew moving forward. Because that's where a lot of people are eventually going to move to. But there's also going to be that sizable percentage of individuals who want to play the games at their highest form of fidelity. They want to play it on their LG 4K 120 hertz television and experience it in all of its wonder. And that's a good secondary skew. You have your flagship traditional stationary home console. Now with the Switch 2 getting those third-party ports... I guess it still comes down to something similar that we saw with the Switch itself. Do you want to have a more compromised version of the game, or would you prefer to pay the same price to play it on your PlayStation 5 or Series X and see it at its best? Or you can even look at it on the Xbox ecosystem right now. If you had the choice of playing a game like Alan Wake 2, would you rather play it on your Series X or your Series S? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a good, good point. Yeah. Series X all the way, right? Right. And that's really what it's going to come down to. With the Switch, a, lar- a large portion of it was curiosity. People wanted to see how a game like Doom 2016, Doom Eternal, or The Witcher 3 could look and run on a handheld. And, you know, Witcher 3, it was a very admirable effort. Yes, it was blurry. Yeah, it didn't run perfectly, but when you're playing in a handheld setting, a game of the scope and scale of Witcher 3, it was like, wow, this is kind of crazy that I'm playing a game of this magnitude in a handheld right now. Moving to the Switch 2, is that curiosity still going to be alive? Or have you already had your fill? Where if you have a game like Alan Wake 2 come to the Switch 2, and let's say it is a blurry mess, it makes the Series S version look as though it is the highest form of the game are you going to invest 60 or 70 dollars to play the game just because it's in a portable form or would that individual who has that type of interest would they have already invested in something like a rog ally or a steam deck to play that game in a handheld setting and i'm not saying the rog ally or the steam deck are competitors to the switch or the switch 2 because they're not they're very niche machines but a certain point of the switch's appeal is going to now be compromised because it's no longer new. It's no longer fresh. The Mm. gimmick of the Switch was AAA gaming on the go. Get the console experience anywhere you want. Can you double dip and do it a second time around and see the same success? Like it will get more games than the Switch got. It's only natural. It's going to be a more capable machine and Steam Deck exists, Series S exists. So there's going to be those lower end SKUs of these titles already out there. So naturally you could probably port those over to the Switch too, maybe with some reductions here or there, depending on where the technical features of the Switch really come into for specs. But the Switch too will get a large portion 
of those AAA games, it's just going to be a question of, is the audience going to be there? And if the audience isn't there, how long is the support going to sustain? Or are we going to see what we've seen in every prior generation? If you're not buying the games, the publisher is not going to bring the games over. And you can look at the Switch even as an example of that. EA has been very reluctant to bring anything to the Switch because the online interface isn't that great. They can't sell you those microtransactions and what's the FIFA and the Madden um, loot box things. Um, Ultimate Team stuff. Yeah. like They couldn't really get those to work because there's not a base to sell those to. So unless Nintendo can also address that, it's going to be an interesting generation for them. It could be very successful. It could also... It's not going to be, you know, an outright failure, but I just wonder if Nintendo is maybe assuming they're going to have a huge interested base due to the success of the Switch, where you shouldn't come in with that. The PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X are very capable machines. They're delivering 4K, 120 hertz. You're competing with that. And if you're going to be the lesser of the three, which it just naturally has to be, it's a hybrid system. Are you going to be able to appeal to the same folks that you appeal to the Switch? You're not a new idea anymore. Some of that excitement has waned. So how do you bring people in? Is there going to be a new gimmick to the Switch 2? Or is just that idea of play Resident Evil 4 Remake on a portable system enough to draw people in a second time around? For me personally, I don't know if that would be enough. Like I'm going to be there for the Switch 2 day one. But certain games I bought on the Switch, like Doom 2016, I may not have that curiosity outside of the first 12 months. Because I'm going to say, let's use Resident Evil 4 Remake as the example game. I've played it. I've played it on my Series X. I've seen the best it can look. I've played the best it can run. Am I really going to invest $60 again just to play it in a portable setting? Probably not. But on the Switch, I would have. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I figured we, we'll talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, Starfield. <laughs> because... Oh, yeah, well, no, I mean, because all of a sudden it popped back up, right? And um, Nate, you had put it out there in January that there was a game coming uh, from Xbox and a claim game that was going to other platforms and eventually ended up being Hi-Fi Rush. And then in February... Um, Xbox era put out a report that Starfield was coming to PlayStation later in the year, uh, which then you said you heard the same thing, but then eventually retracted it because you heard differently. And then Phil Spencer at the podcast said it's not Starfield and Indiana Jones weren't going to at least weren't part of the first four. And, you know, the discussion seemed to have been settled down, but because of another an insider that just popped up out of nowhere uh, <laughs> because this person got the Ghost of Tsushima PC date right. One of the other things he said was that Starfield was supposed to be announced later this year and launch in between November and December on PlayStation. So now this is kind of all the thing once again. Um, what do you, what do you, and what do you got to say about the whole like journey from hearing about the rumors to then putting it out there, but then taking it back to now seeing more of this stuff. Like what's your mindset at on this? The journey was very similar to Starfield itself. Very disjointed. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, <damn. laughs> all right. All right. I, I, I really, I don't care. I really like Starfield. So it's good. <laughs> but yeah, like I had heard Starfield was going to get a PlayStation five port. And then I started to ask around to like some contacts and such to get further backing on it. And within that time frame is when the Xbox error report had happened. So I see that I was like, okay, if they're hearing this as well from different contacts than what I'm hearing it from, there must be, you know, some validity to this information. So I put out my tweet within a day or so putting out the tweet I had numerous contacts reach out to me saying, hey, this isn't happening. In fact, we're hearing that Starfield's going to be named at the Xbox podcast. 
So when I'm hearing that, and I'm hearing that now from over half a dozen contacts, it's all right, way too much of a consensus on that. So I have to put out my backtrack or my retraction on the Starfield PlayStation 5 information, where I wasn't dismissing any other reporting. I was just saying the information I had put out there, I no longer had confidence in, and I'm taking it back regarding Starfield. So any other reporting out there that can stand on its own merits and on its own outlets and such, that's their information. I was just taking back mine. Then the Xbox podcast happens with Phil Spencer, where by name says Indiana Jones and Starfield. These titles are not in the immediate plans, however he put it. So hearing that, I was like, okay. Feeling confident about the information I was having of Starfield is not coming to PlayStation. Now you see the rumors once again pop up this week from this individual Twitter source insider, whomever they are. And the timing just is baffling. If Starfield is to come to PlayStation, and let's say it is, as this rumor suggests, a November to December release, then Phil Spencer and Microsoft naming Starfield just a few weeks back is the biggest PR blunder in history because oh. you cannot recover from that. No one, would be, no one would believe anything you have to say. And yes, they definitely curated exactly how they want to say it probably got approval through a lawyer team and such. The marketing department combed over every word. Because as Phil had to put out there, how did he phrase it? We can't say no to any potential yeah. game. We and can't just, rule anything out, right? And that's just covering your ass that if in five years we do bring a game multiplat, let's say Star, you know, let's say it is Starfield in 2028. That's just I'm saying, well, we never said we would never do it. We can't say never because if we say never and we do, be it in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, someone will go back to this clip and say, you said never. It's yeah. just protection. And that's all that is. Now, the curious thing with Starfield is, to me at least, so many people railed against this game when the reviews hit and in the lead up to launch and post launch. And now everyone is concerned about its fate of whether or not it goes multi-plat. I've never seen a game that got so much hate have such a strong desire now. Is it just because console wars or is there a genuine interest to play the game on PlayStation systems? I think it's a bit of both. I think like the, the fact that, you know, Starfield did sell really well and still has pretty solid concurrent user pl user base. I think there is there is a silent majority out there who do just en enjoy the game, you know. And you go to the Starfield subreddit, people are just enjoying the game. The same thing happened with Fallout 76, you know. Everyone hated on it at launch. People still hate it to this day. It still has a pretty healthy player base, and I think it's probably the most profitable Fallout game ever made at this point. It is just Fallout with multiplayer, you know. And some people just wanted fallout in space and like for what it's worth i sort of took starfield as fallout in space and i do have some problems with it i i don't like the fact they haven't addressed the itemization issues from fallout 4 it's the same issues that with in that game i do think it's very i think the fact that it's the the good the good content is so far spread out across a literal galaxy um, is a problem with the game for the game's pacing, a lot of loading screens, and I put all that stuff in my review. But for me, it wasn't enough to you know not enjoy it because I knew what I was getting. It's Todd Howard, you know, you know, you kind of know what you're getting. Um, but I actually just put out a tweet during the show because I had someone, I had a bunch of people reaching out to me about this new rumor um, shared by the dude who talked about the Ghost of Tsushima stuff, and. Um, I I went to my sources, you know, who are good, who, you know, like to debunk things, you know. Yeah, and so what did you say on Twitter? What, what was your tweet? I have pretty much great sourcing that nobody's working on Starfield for PlayStation right now. Mm. You know, pretty much exactly what Nate said. You know, um, I'll, I'll say definitively. I've got great sourcing that nobody's working on Starfield for PlayStation right now. And like, you know, pretty much like what Microsoft said. I also said nobody knows what the long-term future holds. So you're not, you're not going to see Starfield on, f announced for PlayStation this year. Uh, maybe you're not going to see it next year either, you know. 
Um, and I think so you th- I think, think it's not. I think it's not even for consideration. You think twenty twenty four? Absolutely not. Yes. Right, and maybe there's a chance for twenty twenty five, but but unlikely is what you would say, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't think it's something they're even considering right now. Mm. I think. I think it, they want it to be exclusive. You know. Well, can I? So I'll ask both you and 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 Nate this: Where's all the conflicting info coming from, Nate? I mean, you ever experience? I, I know you you're in the know and you've heard. Have you ever heard like something like this happen where there's this like so many people have heard about it, but then it there's so much conflicting info. Has that ever happened to you uh, at all? It, True. As long as you've been doing this, not to this level. Look, sometimes there is minor conflicting information on some of the finer details, but not something to this extent of intended release on a platform. And that's where I'm not sure where the confusion is really stemming from. I'm not sure if it really falls down to that basic point of there was a meeting of consideration where the game was mentioned and then immediately shot down. And for some reason, that latter portion of information is not being relayed to everyone. Or if there's just some sort of internal marketing discussion that Starfield has come up in, and that is the source of the rumors. It's been a really hard journey of pinpointing exactly what is happening here and why there's so much conflicting information because there's just way too i don't even want to call it smoke because i i think that would validate it too much but it just seems to be fumes like (laughs) yeah fumes going around of this game going multi-plat but maybe does it date back to pre-acquisition because there is a playstation build of starfield in existence is that potentially the source that someone has just become aware of this build and they're assuming that it means something more than it is and not realizing that this is just a canceled build of the game that is shelled for now? Or is it just a case of, hey, Microsoft is going multi-plat. Starfield had started development as a multi-plat game. So let's assume that this is something. Or maybe they were having discussions about long-term planning and select Bethesda games were coming up and Starfield and let's say Indiana Jones were mentioned and they've since revised those plans and that's no longer the intent and it's just old information that's being fed into the rumor mill now. It's hard to say really what's happening here, but I think as Jez put out in his tweet, it doesn't seem as though Starfield is an immediate plan. Now, as also mentioned, could it happen in 2025 or 2026? Yes. As you know, Phil Spencer put it, as you said, anything is possible, but here and now in 2024, it doesn't seem as though it is in consideration. Mm. I, um, and I think, I think you've mentioned before, Jez, what you think is going on here, right? Like a lot of the conflicting messages and stuff. One of the, one of the internal rumors I heard was it was now, and I really want to, I really want to stress here, right? I, I think. I don't think I re really, I think it's really important to say that I don't think Reset Era made it up. I think that and obviously I don't know their sources and they haven't told me of their sources. And I haven't asked who their sources because you don't share your sources, right? It's just not what you do. So I don't know their sources, but I have spoken to people at Reset um not Reset Era, Xbox Era about it. I always get them mixed up. Why can't they why couldn't you pick an, an original branding, John? Um, but uh, I I did um, I did speak to them and I really didn't get the impression that they made it up. What I think, and obviously I don't know, and this is pure speculation because I don't know who told them because you don't share your name with your sources. But I kind of feel like someone in the know told them, uh, uh, so, someone someone who who you know someone they know a bit like a na- someone with a big name, you know, but. The fact of the matter is, a lot of people have been laid off from Microsoft in the last few months. Uh, both from Bethesda, some have left in bad blood, some have left in negative terms. And I think, um, what? I, I, and again, I, I, I mean this with the utmost respect, because I've made, I've made mistakes like this in the past, and I've put out information that was shared to me on an emotional basis. Um, 
uh, you know, from people that I believed and trusted, uh, because, you know, I sort of misunderstood that sometimes people, people share things when they share things about a company, sometimes they do it in an angry way or they do it in a way that sort of, um, makes you question like what what the other side of the story is and i when i was trying to build up a picture of what happened with 343 i really did get the impression from a lot of people that there was just a lot of anger in the in the communique which sort of made me wonder how true some of the stuff was you know i'm sure they felt like it was true but i also got the impression that there's another side to the story here so i also kind of feel like potentially and this is conspiracy theorying but i would not be surprised if someone uh someone who either was or used to be part of those teams sort of put this out there because they knew it would cause this kind of drama and these kind of problems. Maybe they, they had the information wrong and they thought like the four, the four games they knew about meant everything must be coming. And I actually made this mistake myself really recently in December, I think it was, because I put out a tweet saying, which people keep coming back to, I put out a tweet saying, I don't think any games are coming, it's just FUD, right? Uh, when the rumors started spreading. Because I was just like of the assumption that some PlayStation fanboys are spreading these rumors to undermine Xbox or whatever. And um, the reason I thought that was because the games that I investigated, I was told definitively that they weren't coming to PlayStation, no builds exist for those games. The games I didn't investigate was stuff like Pentiment because I, th I, I would never have thought in my wildest dreams, why would they bother porting Pentiment? No one's going to buy it, right? So I didn't bother investigating Pentiment. And to be honest, I don't have great source in Obsidian anyway. So I, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to find out that specifically. But like Starfield was one of the games that I asked about. And um, they, they were like, no, it's not happening. Um, and, uh, you know, but like you, Nate, Reset era, uh, reset era. Xbox era gets a lot of stuff right, a ton of stuff right. Um, and you know, to Nick Nick's credit, he he puts out information that ends up being true a lot of the time. And because similarly to you, Nate, like what you said about you hearing all the rumors, and when when like someone someone like Xbox era, who has kind of made a name for themselves, putting out insider information when they put their stamp of approval on that information and go as far to put a report out there, I just assumed they, they must really know this, you know, and they, they definitely believe the person who's told them this. So like I, my conspiracy theory is that it's, it's someone with a big name, someone who they believe would know this information. It's not just an, a random anonymous person. You know, it's it's someone who is known to be working working for or previously having worked at Bethesda, or the information come from them or something like that. You know, um, which is why historically I've always I've always gone for physical evidence. I want to see gameplay footage. I want to see a build. I want to see a document. You know, because sometimes when you're getting information second or third hand, it's it's become diluted. To the point where it's probably not accurate. So, like, what, like we say, there is smoke and there are fumes, and there were fumes about all these rumors about multi-platform stuff. The complete picture of of what's actually happening only really emerged in that Xbox business update, and then we found out for sure that it was the four games and the Hi-Fi Rush, like you said, um, and uh, yeah, when that dropped. Um, I managed to get Sea of Thieves. Um, I still didn't know about Grounded or Pentiment until other people spoke about it. So the only game I really knew about was Sea of Thieves, definitively. But yeah, it, it was it was a whole mess, and I think it, there, it is a mess because people do think there are, there is fanboy tribalism aspects to it for sure. People, some people want to see Xbox die. But on the other side, people very much don't want to see Xbox die. And there is valid reason to think that if Microsoft completely got rid of all of its exclusives, that people will not see a reason to buy the system. But mm -hmm. whether or not the strategy pays off remains to be seen. And I think from Microsoft's perspective, they're looking at Sony's profit margins and they're probably thinking... We can't really 
follow Sony's strategy to, towards growth because Sony's not seeing growth. Sony's the biggest platform. Sony's doing all this stuff. Sony's doing everything that our, you, our hardcore users want us to do. But Sony also has 8% profit margin. You know, 6%. 6%. <laughs> yeah, right. God, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, not, that's spooky. So like you say, you're saying to Microsoft, we want you to copy Sony's strategy into their downward spiral. Make it make sense, <laughs> you know? Right, and that's where the multi-platform idea comes in. Yeah. And like I had seen some individuals speculate over the idea of, could this have been a situation of Microsoft itself having a split on the multi-platform initiative and planting maybe bad information to get an uprising, to get vocal critics saying, you can't do this. And by mentioning titles like Starfield, Hellblade 2, Gears of War, those types of games that's going multi-plat, though the intention doesn't truly exist, we'll say, just to get that, that outrage, to get the dissenting opinion, so they could then use it in a meeting saying, our fans don't want this. Like I've seen that go around as speculation, and I wouldn't be surprised. We've we know how close Microsoft works with certain influencers of their brand. Mm -hmm. Do I think Microsoft would go to such a psyops mission? No, because if you're that influencer being told false information by let's say, you know, an individual that you trust there just to get a reaction, I think that would be incredibly dirty pool of a tactic to use. But at the same time, as you were mentioning, if you just have an angry employee who maybe departed recently, comes out and says, hey, this is a plan. And maybe it was a plan when they were there, but it was scrapped a couple months later. It really just muddies that communication. Yeah. Where now we're at the point of well over a month out, you have to put out a tweet saying, there is no build of Starfield on PlayStation 5 in active development. Yeah, And, you know, that's going to be met with some hesitation by individuals where they're going to say, well, I've heard otherwise. Or people are going to say, well, you see, he says right now, that doesn't mean it won't happen eventually, which nobody is dismissing the possibility of it happening. Anything can happen at any time if Microsoft wills it to be. Yeah. But we're not, we're not mind readers. We're not fortune tellers. We can't say what Microsoft's plans are with Starfield in 2025 or 2026. It's just that here in the present, this is the information that we know, and that's what we're relaying. The information that's pertinent to today at this moment. It could be wrong in 24 hours, but it's not wrong right now. That's exactly it. You know, and that's the, that's the difficulty with, with like the journalism aspects of being a content creator. Like I'm not a trained journalist, you know, um, and and it's it's kind of it's kind of annoying when you sort of you know you if you put out like a human story right um it's hard to debunk because it's kind of like well that's their perspective if i put out a story that like that okay the, i've got four people four sources who tell me this person's to blame for halo infinite's life service disaster or whatever um but still, there could be like eight people on the team who say otherwise, and I just haven't got around to speaking to them. But because it's like someone's perspective, you can't really debunk that. But when you're talking about like definitively a yes or no binary answer, will will Starfield go to PlayStation? Will it not go to PlayStation? It's kind of more difficult because it's like, yeah, if it does go to PlayStation in like like three, four, five years, then people will come back to this tweet and be like, you said it wasn't going to come. And, and also like... And just now, when I put in the tweet, like no, no one can predict the future. I got a bunch of people in the in the DM saying, like, "Oh, look, he he left it open for for 2025," and and oh, look, he left it open for someone other than Bethesda to develop it. It's like, man, it's just... <laughs> see, I mean, that's people the just thing believe is, whatever they want. Yeah, and it's really been it's become very complicated to relay any type of information of what is happening at the moment because people like to use the idea that we have this ace in the hole called plans changed mm. and it's an overused card where i have never used that card if it's wrong i will own the mistake 
but they also have this weird resistance to the idea that let's say Starfield rumors, you know, kick up for real. You report it on Windows Central. People will point to your tweet saying, oh, so you're changing course? No, it's new updated information. <laughs> Why is an update viewed so negatively? Yeah. Like, this is an update. This means, hey, something's happening. But what I said back in March of 2024 was relevant to its time. Now I'm updating you in November of 2025 that discussions are now happening. Yeah. They, they don't con- you know, they don't conflict with each other. They're two independent statements. Yeah. And people just don't want to accept that. They they want updates and accurate information, but hate when you update with accurate information. <laughs> it's a hard I, it's a I, hard it's a hard, you know, line to walk. And and then then I then I hear some people say that well, well don't just don't share anything. You know, and it's like I, I see that backlash against inside information as well, where it's like, well, these guys are just looking for cloud, they're just looking for clicks and whatever, and and it's just like, man, you 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 can't win. <laughs> you, know, you just literally can't win. But oh well, yeah, that's the that's the that's uh, the job, man. That is the job. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing I've always found funny where people are like, oh, you you want all the glory and no the and none of the blame. What glory? <laughs> yeah, this is such a thankless, so thankless on, job. Uh, on Reddit in a tier of insiders, the glory. Yeah, like, right? there's yeah, there's no glory that comes with this. There's no clout that comes with this. All that comes is a headache and a concern of even though I'm ninety nine point nine 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 percent certain of what I was told, that point zero one percent haunts you until it is confirmed. Like. Phil Spencer could walk into my house, shake my hand, look at me and say, Gear 6 will get a 10 out of 10 on Metacritic. And it'll be the greatest game of all time. I wouldn't share that because I'd be saying to myself, what if Phil is wrong? Mm. Or he could come to me and say, here's the Xbox portable. You have the first one off the line. No one else outside of you and me knows this exists. And you can report on it right now and you could take pictures of it i'd still be i'd still be saying to myself what if they cancel it tomorrow dude i have a story about this um have you ever heard of the surface neo <laughs> no. well M- microsoft made a, a dual screen surface tablet which had two different screens and you could use the bottom screen as a keyboard and, and it had a magnet thing where you could put the keyboard on it um they we reported on it and it was literally it was literally shipping it was literally in transit to ship to to retailers and then microsoft canceled it they canceled it in transit to ship and um for some reason still don't fully know the reason why they canceled it because it seemed like a really cool ass device but um this is like the it was the ultimate example of plans change you know and there's like there's a warehouse somewhere where there's like a pile of Surface Neo devices just sitting there doing nothing. And um, this device was so real that one of our journalists acquired a <laughs> prototype from from the manuf- from uh, someone, <laughs> a manufacturer, at great expense. And um, Microsoft was not happy about that. They were not happy about that. Um, because we we we'd acquired a prototype and we we did a we did a we did an unofficial review of the Surface Neo after <laughs> it was cancelled and they were not happy about it. But um, plans do change, and it's the the game industry is so secretive, and it's not like with the Surface Neo we could get our hands on a prototype, we could find someone in a manufacturer and buy the product and all that kind of stuff, or or acquire the product. I I don't know how I don't know how. Zach does it I mean, to be honest, but you can't do yeah, that with a game, you know, unless someone no. illegally leaks you a build and then you get, you know, Nintendo's lawyers on your ass like you do. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. The industry is just so fluid. I mean, I've been told of projects that got approved that were in development for, you know, six months, 12 months, and mm. they never, they never released. And it would just be one of those cases that if I had reported on it, if I had mentioned the project, as an active thing that it would have been accurate that it's canceled while in development you know i have no influence on that that's beyond my control Mm. and 
I think the issue is just the online discourse immediately goes from you are either a messiah or you are just a liar. There's yeah. no in between. There's no plans could have changed. The, the information was accurate for its time. It's just you're right or you're wrong. Yeah. There's nothing else that they're willing to entertain. And it really complicates how one approaches things because some inside information you see reported now might just be an outlet that got the press release 12 hours early because someone they know got the press release under embargo and they gave it to the outlet saying, well, I can't report it on for another 12 or 24 hours, but you didn't agree to the terms. Here you go. Mm -hmm. It's not inside information. You're reporting a press release a little early, but people look at it and say, oh, look, they're always right. It's not exactly hard to miss when you have the press release in hand. And that yeah. does happen quite often. Or, yeah, I don't know. It's all um, fun and games. Nate, what you, so I, I'm sure you saw this, but um, Warner Brothers wants more Suicide Squads and less Hogwarts Legacies. I can't really wrap my mind around that decision because one game sold 23 million copies in a calendar year and the other game probably doesn't have 23 players right now on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, Jez, look it up. How many people are playing Suicide Squad right now on Twitch? Is it more or less than uh, Foam Stars? Yeah, Suicide Squad versus Foam Stars, the battle of the century, right? Let's, let's have a quick... <laughs> let's a quick but why, do you, why would you think they would say that, like, that they would they want more they they want to move away from the AAA uh, volatile industry to do more free to play mobile live service stuff when Suicide Squad is they by their own admission didn't meet their expectations like that was a shocker we could all we all saw that coming a mile away and right. the 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 game that essentially beat out Call of Duty which normally is the best selling unless there's a Rockstar game. 25 million copies or whatever. No, we don't want to do that. We want to chase more live service stuff. When you can make the argument the live service stuff is kind of saturated and there isn't a lot of room for it anymore. Right. Like, what it, the hell is going on at these companies? It feels like WB is about to learn the lesson the rest of the industry learned over five years ago. For mm -hmm. whatever reason, they're behind the trend. And the only thing I could really come up with is they're looking at the sales of Hogwarts Legacy saying we sold exceptionally well, we made a lot of money, but it's kind of a one and done acquisition. Like it's a one and done dealing. You buy the game, we don't have anything else to really sell you. With the live service games, we want you to buy the game and we're going to sell you new characters, packs, expansions, skins, stickers, all that other type of crap. And they view that as that's an, that's an ATM. Mm. Whereas the other one is a single transaction. So we want the ATM, but the industry has learned that ATM doesn't withdraw money to every customer who comes up with it. Many deposit money and never see a return. And that's why we saw so many industry closures. If you can be very successful with single player games like the Arkham Trilogy, Hogwarts, do it. Like, yes, there's an inherent risk that you may not get a 20 million seller of every game that you're putting out there. But wouldn't you maybe rather take that more conventional approach of releasing a game that is quality, that can have high sales potential than investing a lot of money into a live service game that if there is no audience, you have to ax after 12 months and you're going to lose millions upon millions of dollars. It, feels as though it's just that it's the accountant business decision of these games can make us a lot of money in the long term versus making a lot of money in the short term and then having to immediately reinvest the profits of a game like Hogwarts Legacy into a sequel. So you don't get to sit on the money for a long period of time like a live service game where you're just assuming it's a large flow of money year after year, month after month. So I think, I think it's one of the stupidest things I've heard a modern day company come up with because that's the exact opposite that the industry and other companies are moving, you know, the direction towards. I mean, you had EA just come out and say, we're not going to do licensed games anymore. Yeah, We're going to go internal and use our IPs, which says to me, we don't want to invest and pay the licensing fees 
to these outside companies because we saw from the Insomniac leak. Sony is paying in the area of, what, 75 to $100 million to use Spider-Man and Miles Morales? That's a lot of money for a character. It sure is. And, I mean, who knows? I still think Sony would continue to do that because... Um... It plays well for what their goal is. I mean, I'm wondering, what did Microsoft pay for Blade? What is yeah. Microsoft paying for Indiana Jones? But they also... Sony own the rights to Spider-Man for movie franchises, right? Right, yeah, just, yeah. So, yep. dri driving hype for Spider-Man potentially helps keep the character relevant and does create some sort of feedback loop for them in terms of, you know, continuing that franchise to be a thing. But, like, you know, it's it's more difficult for EA because, and right now, they're probably looking at, um, they're probably looking at the fact that, uh, you know, Epic Games um, is in bed with Disney now, and they're going to be building uh, Star Wars games that help Epic Games potentially to to grow to grow games that they're building with Star Star Wars license. So it's no wonder that EA is pulling back. But well, I, I wonder, I wonder what EA has those studios working on a Black Panther game. Um, they have them working oh. on an Iron Man game. Uh, and I, I think there's also like a Captain America Black Panther game, but I'm not sure if that's at EA or not. Um, mm. but there's at least two games, and it's sort of like if you're at that company, at that studio, and you hear the CEO being like, "We're moving away from licensed IPs," are you thinking to yourself, "Oh shit, I might want to update my LinkedIn." <laughs> what happens when mm, Black right. Panther ships? Are they gonna shut down that studio? Because, I mean, they shut down that Battlefield studio, Ridgeline Games, and they hadn't even done anything yet. Right. I mean, that's going to be that inherent fear of anyone who is working on these projects. I guess you kind of have to hope that maybe EA sees those development teams as well-equipped to take on one of their internally owned IP, which really begs the question of what IPs does EA really own? outside of sports and you know you're yeah. bioware with mass effect and dragon age you have the sims when you, you got the football of... game fc now which they didn't need fifa yep. for right yeah so you, you kind of have to really wonder what ip what ip ea really referring to in this case like you have the nba street that you don't Apex. do anything with yeah Titan, the titanfall <laughs> universe right yeah you got yeah you have like titanfall but it's not as though they're sitting on this rich back catalog of franchises they no. kind of have to start to get they more kill the <laughs> invest. yeah they killed a hell of a lot you have to get creative again ea to the shock of many 20 years ago ea was a powerhouse they had so much they variety were. in what they offered ssx the street series madden lord of the rings army EA, of two Army of Two. As, as I mean, Joaquin says in the chat, <laughs> Army of Two. <laughs> like they were so rich in their variety. And then they became such a safe, risk adverse company. And that's the EA that we have today. A lot of revenue, you know, though. A lot of oh, faithful tons of revenue. But, you know, maybe time creatively to reduce some of those budgets and bankrupt. create a lot of smaller games. Yeah, yeah, they're creatively bankrupt, exactly what they are. So, I um I I'm like the biggest Dragon Age fan, like Dragon Age Origins. I've completed that more than any other game except Final Fantasy VII, the original, maybe. And what they've done to Bioware over the years is just so depressing. And now, like G Dragon Age Dreadwolf supposedly launching this year, and I'm just like, I just can't help but feel like this game is not gonna. And I haven't I haven't seen anything of it, but I just feel it in my bones that Dragon Age Dreadwolf. He's not going to do anything. And it's weird. Do you, th do you think Dreadwolf might be a make it or break it moment for Bioware? Could be. It really could be. You know, but I suppose like the difference with Bioware is they have a lot of, I suppose like if we're doing a comparison to Rocksteady, because I think Rocksteady's going to have a really hard, you know, year coming up ahead of them. At least with bioware they do have some or well more of a legacy a back catalog that is still selling 
at least to some degree, which does cash flow your wages and stuff like that, right? Whereas, like, I don't know how many people are still buying Arkhamverse games with regards to Rocksteady. But I do, even with that in mind, I, I think it probably is a make it or break moment for Bioware because we know they're working on a new Mass Effect, but it's going to be like if Dragon Age Dreadwolf, which, you know, I kind of feel like the fact that they've put, they've put a subtitle on this game, you know, rather than calling it Dragon Age 4 or something, I think that's going to be reflective of the fact that it's going to be very different from what Dragon Age fans typically expect. You know, from looking from mm -hmm. like what we've seen of it so far, looks more like an action game potentially. It looks, it doesn't look like the tactical kind of game that Dragon Age used to be or what fans really wanted the game. And like, it's really funny because Dragon Age Two went more in that direction. And everyone hated it, so they went back to what their roots in Dragon Age Inquisition. People liked it more. I think it even won Game of the Year. But then like. They're making the same mistake again with Dragon Age Rebel, so I'm so nervous about it, but I think the truth yeah, of the cool. matter is a lot of the people that may buy where what it is simply just don't work there anymore, you know? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting time for Bioware because, man, I remember when Mass Effect came out on the 360 or even Jade Empire on the original Xbox. Mm. Those were, those were, you know, very defining games of their generations yeah. and i would love i would have loved for them to hd remaster remake anything with jade empire why that is forgotten just baffles me yeah it's an interesting right there discussion. it's right there yep. but i, I mean bioware bioware is going to be an interesting thing to watch after dread wolf comes out because it does feel as though with the way the industry is going, which I mean, it's basically in a recession that if Dragon Age doesn't hit on all cylinders, EA might be eyeing them saying, we we will either shut you down or we're going to be looking for a buyer. And if they're looking for a buyer, come on, Microsoft, come in and get them. You've worked well with each other in the past. They can bring some good IP over. Mass Effect was a huge deal on the 360. Bring this team to you. Bring them over. You'd have basically <laughs> every notable Western role-playing developer outside of Larian and CD Projekt Red under your label at this point. It's not a bad That's thing true. to have. That is true. Well, speaking of this, so we'll get you out on this question here because I know it's it's about time. Well, but... well, just 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 before then, let's play another game. Okay, Guess well, so what the Suicide was, Squad well, numbers. Okay. Uh, Which Suicide uh, Squad numbers? How many people are watching watching it right this minute? I'm watching right this minute. Yeah. 1250. 1250, okay. I know they did they did they did just announce season one's coming soon. I'll say there is 240 people watching. The 798 people. So, well, not not not, not, not ideal. Mm -hmm. Not 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 ideal. Not great. Not, not, not the great. great. Not the not, not the, the greatest. Not the greatest. I mean, I mean, it's, yeah. it's at least fifteen I mean, times better than Foam Stars. For context, <laughs> there are more than double the amount of people playing heroes watching Heroes of the Storm right now. <laughs> what about what about Gotham Knights? How many people are streaming Gotham Knights? Probably two. <laughs> Gotham Knights, let's have a look. Gotham Knights is 43 viewers. So it's beating mm. Foam Stars. That's beating Foam Stars by a by three. Three <laughs> times the amount of people. <laughs> That's <t> <laughs> Oh man. I mean we can we can have a quick look at like what the top games are right now before we before we finish up. Uh Matt, oh you, that's weird. You can't as far as I can tell. You can't sort by most played games anymore. Are they changed? Most viewed. It? Yeah, I don't know. Following Discover Luna, what is that? Yeah, it feel, I think they've. I oh, know they have. Never mind. Oh, you can see it. Right. So number one is just chatting, um, of course. which is, you know, I suppose where all the the thirst traps are. Number one is the number one game is Grand Theft Auto Five. You got mm -hmm. Counter Strike, wow. Elise of Legends, Valorant, and Dota 2. 
So Valve and Riot and dominating with 2K there. Fortnite is... What? Okay, so Fortnite is uh, the sixth highest, and then you will never guess what the seventh highest is. It's a game I've never heard of called Supermarket Simulator. Wait, you... yeah, Supermarket <laughs> Simulator, where you go shopping in a supermarket. Uh, that has 80,000 <laughs> viewers right now on Twitch. A lot of people are playing suit. So that must be some kind of sponsored thing, maybe. Um, but then you've got like <laughs> Call of Duty Warzone, Minecraft, Apex, Helldivers, Elden Ring is still doing well. Five Nights at Shrek's Hotel, <laughs> which looks like a weird, a weird Five Nights at Freddy's Shrek game that'll Dude. probably get sued. Dead by Daylight, World of Warcraft still doing really well, which is just wild to me. Overwatch you know, is slipped uh, down. Yeah. I didn't mention, but in the partner preview, uh, they highlighted a game mode in Roblox. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was uh, like a game mode with like Chucky or something. But Oh, that's what people are. I had some people talking about Chucky today. I didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah, it was it's some... You you might groan, but Roblox is yeah. serious business, man. Uh, so we'll get you out on this. A nice little fun little question. You know, I, I was thinking like, oh, maybe I'll ask him about the future of the industry, but I was like, ah, oh, let's get him out on this. Um The Xbox showcase in the summer, what do what are you what are you uh what are your expectations for that? In a word, greatness. Greatness. I like I th- that word. I think this will be it has the potential of being the best showcase Microsoft has had in well over a decade because there's so many titles they can give us updates on in June. It's just a question of whether or not we see the games come June because you naturally have to assume we will see Avowed. We will see Indiana Jones. We should see the Starfield expansion DLC. We ideally get a first look at Gears of War 6. We should see Fable again. Perfect Dark, I would say, is kind of the wild card because that kind of feels as though maybe that would be more of a game award type of presentation or update on that game. But this could be a monumental show for Microsoft come June. There's so many titles that we need updates on Contraband. Yeah. Remember State that game? Decay, like there's Everwild. Yeah. I mean, like... you know, there's, there's the Wu-Tang game. Yeah, the Wu-Tang game, yeah. Like, what happened to that there? What's going on there? Oh, who, who, um, who talks about that? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Hmm. It's another um, one of them too, uh, too early <laughs> things, I think. Jez, Jez put out a tweet, which I wonder if he knows, because he's like, would you be okay with the two-hour Xbox show or whatever? Like, he knows it's being planned for two hours, you know? I know, well, I, I know, they're go- I know that they're going back and forth on the length. Would it include ABK? Presumably, if you're going two hours, it would probably have to, right? See, I mean, that's where the show can be huge. If you have all the Activision Blizzard King stuff, you have the Zenimax Bethesda stuff, you have Microsoft Game Studio, this show could be of legend, or it's just going to be a huge disappointment, depending, <laughs> you know, they walk out again. We're going to focus on the next nine months. Oh, could months. you imagine? Like, Tomatoes you, thrown at the t- screen. Yeah. I mean, you'd even have to assume depending on how they're approaching this release schedule, we're due a Forza Horizon game. Yeah, could be this year, could be next year. But yeah, yeah. they're on right on that, that target. But the June showcase, this could be big for them. If we even get half of the games I mentioned, that's already a damn good show. Never about- mind other stuff that you're going to get from third-party partners, be it Capcom, Square Enix, and so forth. I mean, where's Octopath Traveler 2? How is that not in the show today? Aren't we do that game in the spring? That's yeah, well, question. didn't the uh, I, we we were doing the show on Friday and we saw that it got delisted on uh, the eShop, and apparently, like, what it was um, change of publisher, change um, of publisher, yeah, the yeah, publisher no. Nintendo's yeah, like interface isn't doesn't support that very well or yeah. something. Yeah, now Square Enix will be the publisher of the digital version on the eShop. Yeah, what about the uh, what about the rumored Gears collection, right? You got to figure if they show Gears of War six, that if a Gears collection exists, you have to do them in tandem. Yeah, 
like get excited like here's the gear six trailer holy shit and in the meantime we have the gears of war collection containing gears one two three and judgment available this you know this november emergence day but i mean it feels as though the june showcase should be where we see microsoft really hit their stride this is what we have coming even if it's games coming out in 2026 it doesn't matter get us hyped because you have enough coming out in 2024 and what we're expected to come out in 2025 that you have a lot of momentum on your side right now you just have to capitalize on it are you expecting the new controller and the digital series x to make an appearance as well there's rumors around those yeah i mean we've definitely seen microsoft in the past showcase revisions of hardware in their June showcases, well, E3, I should say, not June showcases, but in their E3 conferences. So it seems like a nice little venue to make that announcement. Just don't end the show on it because nobody's going to care about a cylinder-shaped Xbox Series X that's digital only. Just Hmm. throw that in the middle when everything's slowing down to begin with. And if you have the new controller with what's rumored to have the haptics, I believe that was it. Yeah, easier easier to port your games to PlayStation when you you have a haptic controller, right? (laughs) Make finally have, sport, yeah. have the parody version of um, Hi-Fi Rush on Xbox, finally. <laughs> yeah, finally. <laughs> but no, I think that June Showcase, I think it could be one hell of a show for Microsoft if they decide to play all their cards. It's just going to be a question of what do they prioritize for June over the Game Awards? Or do they give something to Jeff Keighley for, you know, Summer Game Fest and then hold other things for, the, for their own June Showcase? And then you hold one or two things for the game awards because since 2019 microsoft has always brought at least one thing to the game award and it's usually something of note except for 2022 when everybody expected them to and they didn't show up with anything and people well, were pissed I mean, 2022 microsoft had nothing anyways so yeah and then they, they did the first developer uh direct the following month anyways but yeah yep um so I mean, it could be it could be a really good show for Microsoft, and I'm hoping it is because the last couple they've been strong. Last year's mm-hmm. was good. You had Fable in it, and I mean, I guess that was the big thing was finally seeing Fable and show it again. Show the gameplay. I'm using air quotes because people don't want to believe that we did see some gameplay last year, but show a nice sampling of gameplay. Show the exploration. Highlight a little more of the humor and just how the game is going to be comprised and maybe maybe i would love for them to announce in june that they're going to do a second half of the year developer direct where they Mm. further highlight some of the games maybe they showcased in june that would be coming out later this year or in the early portion of 2025 that would be cool that definitely would be super awesome if they i mean i'm all for the more shows i know that this the, the show this today I, I have seen a lot of positive sentiment on it. Um, I just looked at Jeff Keighley's poll, and uh, uh, apparently the people on the internet did not like the show. <laughs> it's probably, I mean, it probably just comes down to the software variety that was on display. You got uh, on Jeff Keighley's show, you have 11,000 votes, and D is winning with 31%. Why? And then What did people B, expect? People just hate games or something? I, I and, don't get it. B has 28%, C has 25%, and A has 14%. So it's really like a B minus, C plus. Yeah, but D D was the number one option. But like, what did people expect? It was an indie showcase. It's not as though they promised AAA games or anything. I mean, I guess you could give it a D if you're expecting Hollow Knight Silk Song, because that game's been in its cocoon waiting to hatch for the better part of... I mean, what is it? Wow, that was really poetic. It's cocoon. Yeah, it's waiting. About you know what I picked? You know the thing that sucks is in my fantasy draft, not only did I pick uh, Hollow Knight Silk Song, right, as one of my games, I picked Metroid Prime 4, and then Switch 2 has been delayed to next year, so I'm probably going to lose out on that one as well. I mean, I'm hoping that Team Cherry changes the main character of Silk Song to a cicada because it's taken about seven years for this thing to hatch. Yeah, when... <laughs> When was it at the Xbox show? Was that 2021 or 2022? It was 2022, right? 2022, when they promised everything on screen will come out in the next 12 months. Look, and look, there's look, still games let, from that show that haven't come out yet. Let, let, you let know them, what else we're owed? Let them cook. 
Oh, they, they've been cooking for a while. I mean, at this point, this is going to be one <laughs> hell of a stew. But you know what else we're owed? And I hate to say it. We're what? owed Redfall DLC. That is true. Ooh. We are old Redfall DLC. Yeah, we are. Damn. And it's just basically two <laughs> characters. And it's, it's you know what? I, I'm going to say that'll come with the one year anniversary. We are already in March. Maybe they just wait till like May. Right? Yay. I'm just saying, I don't know, but they do, they do owe people uh, the two extra characters. Yeah, those handful of people who bought the bite, bite back edition. And, and Nate was one of the few people who beat the game. I did. I beat that game. Saw the mm-hmm. end. Saw, Saw the, the credits end. roll and I sat there saying, what the hell did I just play? It's not terrible. It's not a 57 is what you're saying? It's not a 57. It might be like a 65. Mm-hmm. It's not the worst thing in the world. It had some good ideas that were just implemented and executed so poorly. But I love the setting. It was a really good setting, like the New England feel to it. It was just so repetitive and derivative that it wasn't that engaging. And I played it in co-op the whole way through. And yeah. like we went through it. We had fun. There were some moments where we were like, whoa, this is actually really cool. But that moment lasted all of five minutes. It it felt like it was probably a game when pitched sounded super exciting. And then they made it and they looked at it and said, yeah, this isn't what we thought. Yeah. Uh, Jacqueline has one question for you. I guess we'll get out of here on this. It says, predict the game of the year nominees, or at least what would be the game of the year nominees out of the ones that we know of so far, games that have come out and released. Uh, I mean, released so far. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth for sure, right? Yeah, you'd have Rebirth up there for sure. Dragon's Dogma um, 2 is probably a lock, I would imagine, based on the previews. Yeah, yeah Dogma 2. Um, I think Prince of Persia deserves a Game of the Year nod. Absolutely, it won't though. I won't get one. It won't, but it should. Um, Bill and Bones. No, no, no. Yeah, we've well, been see, enjoying our always... great skull and bones footage from the show this week. I, I had <laughs> before the switch got delayed, I had locked in the 3D Mario game that would eventually release with the console. Right. But um, that ain't there no more. Can Can Elden could, Ring win? Uh, I was going to ask that. Could Elden Ring's DLC be Game of the Year nominated? It's pretty beefy. It is. I mean, the Kikuza game reviewed very well. You did report that Hellblade 2 internally was expecting uh, like a 90. Yeah. Internally. It won't get yeah. that externally, but internally. Oh, it won't get that externally. So what do you... So if they're <laughs> expecting it internally as like a 90, what do you think they'll get externally then? An 82? 83? I mean, people were really upset when they learned that the game's not that much longer than the first game, which was Jez, shocking you, to me. Jez had reported that he... You had heard that they were lowballing that, right, Jez? Lowballing which, sorry? The the length of Hellblade two. Um, I wouldn't say that, but mm. I, they just didn't want to. They didn't want people to go in with the wrong expectations. It sounds like like if you're the, I think probably that they were accurate with the average length of most players, but right. like I think like hard more hardcore players like you, maybe we'll get more out of it. And do more content, maybe. I mean, yes. it's my most anticipated game. I can't wait for Hellblade Two. I'm really, looking I can't forward look. To it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, but some people they were so upset about the length, even the price turned them off a bit. So you got to wonder if any of that's going to play into review scores a bit. But I think it'll settle in the mid 80s on Metacritic, mm-hmm. between like you know, like at the 84 to 87, maybe 88 range, anywhere between that. If it goes lower, oof. But it, maybe if it gets that ninety, though, maybe it's that good, right? Hey, be a nice. That'd be that'd be nice super change. Cool. Nice change for him. I mean, uh, like avowed, I don't think will make nah. game of the year conversation at all. Indiana, Indiana Jones, Jones, I think mm. we'll have a strong case. Yeah, based on what well, we've seen so far. If Indiana Jones is truly launching in December, then it obviously won't miss. It'll miss the game of the uh, the Keeleys, right? So game Unless of the year is already decided. Early lads. Enough. It's Dragon's what? Dogma. Um, Dogma okay. 2 is game of the year. Um, it's not so... I mean, Rebirth is going to be there fighting it. Nah. Dragon's Dogma better, man. It's better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll see. 
like Indiana Jones, they could get around that if they if they're given review code in advance of the deadline. Because remember, Sony did it with Death Stranding. That is true. They did. They ensured that game was going to get some sort of recognition at the Game Awards. So, mm. uh, what about Rise of the Ronin? Mm. No, I don't. I, I think Helldivers would have a better chance than Rise of the Ronin, unless we. Well, we'll see what the reviews are. But I mean, people love Helldivers, and it's constantly Hell- going. I mean, maybe. I think Helldivers Two is the Boulder's Gate Three of this year. It could be. What about Baltro? That game got really, really, really high reviews. Indie game. You know, they like to give an indie game a nom here and there. Uh, the card yeah. game. I need to play like that. The poker, the poker roguelike or something. Yeah, I need to play I don't know. We need to see how the rest of the year plays out. But Yeah, I mean, it's... What is it? March. 5th. It's only March. But I do think we, we, we at least have Final Fantasy locked for sure and probably Dragon's Dogma locked. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I would give Indiana Jones the closest to a lock as we can at this point, unless something cataclysmically goes wrong with that game. Oh, I have, I have faith uh, in machine game. Trigger Trey says Metaphor Fantasia has a chance. It's an Atlas game, and pe- the reviewers do like yeah, Atlas. That's true. So That's a good point. But anyways, I uh, I wanted to thank you, Nate, for coming on. Um, yeah, man, this make sure fun. to let the Everybody know where they can uh, find you at, where your podcast with uh, MVG or your other podcasts with John from Spawn Wave, you know? Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Talk Xbox and just the industry with you too. But you can find me on YouTube at Nate the Hate, where MVG and I host a podcast usually every week talking all things in the industry. And you can also find me on the Spawncast Network with John of the Spawncast on the Direct Xbox podcast, where we talk all things Microsoft and Xbox. It's every two weeks. Our last episode was last Friday. It is a live show every, well, every other week, Friday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. So if that's something you want to give a look, we will definitely, definitely look forward to your support. And again, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I loved it. Yeah, uh, fun, getting man. to hear your insights about everything. So. Um, yeah, guys, we'll be back on Friday for the Xbox regular Xbox Two show, and um, yeah, this will be going live to this will be Patreon exclusive for a week, and then go to live to, live to everybody uh, after that. But um, yeah, thank you guys. There's no point saying that because the day. <laughs> no, nobody, <laughs> nobody what? who gets it next week is going to hear you say that for it to be okay. relevant. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I just wanted to say it again. Uh, but we'll see you again uh, later this week. Later, yes. guys. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much, Nate. And we are out.